George Foreman's loss to Muhammad Ali left him in a very dark place. Before the Rumble in the Jungle, Foreman had steamrolled through the heavyweight division. He had knocked out Joe Frazier in only two rounds to gain the title, pushing down Frazier's cross guard to create openings, and timing Frazier's head movement to land his thunderous uppercuts. He did the same to elite heavyweight Ken Norton, destroying him in only two rounds to defend his title. Both Frazier and Norton had beaten Ali, Frazier sending him to the canvas, and Norton breaking his jaw. So Foreman had every reason to believe that he was the baddest man on the planet. It seemed self-evident that Foreman's fight with Ali would be a slaughter, and that Foreman would rule the heavyweight division for years to come. But then, one of the most iconic moments in boxing history. I've talked at length about the rumble in the jungle, explaining how Ali used Foreman's own habits against him. But the greatest damage Ali did to Foreman was not to his body, but to his mind. An older, more humble Foreman would later explain that during this time he would have nightmares where he was on the canvas and couldn't get up, and that at times he wished he had died in the fight, that the very core of him no longer existed. And so, in an attempt to perhaps regain some part of himself that was lost, Foreman decided to fight five men on the same night. The idea was to create a spectacle, a vulgar display of power. The five boxers were men with far inferior records, and they were each expected to fall easily to Foreman's devastating power. Muhammad Ali was to sit ringside to commentate, becoming a witness to Foreman's glory. But things did not go to plan, and the night became one of the most bizarre spectacles in boxing history. Foreman appeared unhinged before the fight even began arguing with Ali and pushing one of his opponents. The first man he fought was a journeyman by the name of Alfonso Johnson. With 23 wins and 18 losses, Johnson hadn't fought professionally for years, instead serving as Ali's sparring partner. Foreman began by dancing around the ring, perhaps in imitation of Ali, maybe to mock him or maybe to show he could do it just as well. Foreman continued clowning the first round, but missed most of the shots he threw and took several blows to the body. The crowd that Foreman had hoped to win back began to boo him. Ali began to coach his sparring partner, shouting at him to take his time and cover up and lay against the ropes. In response, Foreman pulled Johnson back into the center of the ring and, enraged, knocked him down, landing a shot through his guard. Foreman then came over to taunt Ali. Johnson got up, but Foreman made quick work of him. Whatever joy Foreman derived from the knockout was quelled when the crowd began chanting Ali's name during the break. The next fighter was Jerry Judge, a more formidable opponent with a 15-4-1 record. Judge scored some decent shots as Foreman remained entirely defensive, perhaps hoping to reserve his strength for later rounds. Foreman put on pressure after Judge landed a hard lead hook, stunning him. For the first time, Foreman seemed to take the match seriously. He began employing his old techniques pulling Judge's head down into uppercuts, and pushing at him to break his guard and disrupt his balance. Judge went down with half a minute left, and Foreman again went to talk to Ali. Judge came back swinging and survived the first round, but Foreman caught Judge near the end of the next round with a vicious hook, and the fight was stopped. And here's where an already strange night got even stranger. Foreman came over to Judge, and Judge seemed to think it was to acknowledge him as a good competitor. Instead, Foreman began to bully Judge, resulting in a real fight with Judge throwing Foreman and ending up on top on the ground. In the meanwhile, Ali yelled, that's number two, George, number two. The crowd booed, throwing bottles into the ring and chanting once again, Ali, Ali, Ali. The night had truly descended into madness. Terry Daniels was Foreman's next opponent, a man who had once been given a shot at the title against Frazier and had not done well. In this match, Foreman seemed to return more to form, knocking down and dominating Daniels. At the end of the round, Ali shouted, he can whoop these five men, but he can't whoop one me. It seemed no matter how well Foreman did, he couldn't quiet the one voice that tormented him. Foreman continued to dominate in the second until the fight was stopped by the ref. Daniels, feeling the stoppage unfair, followed Foreman, and yet again, a fight broke out after the match was over. Foreman then pushed Daniels' trainer, and, for lack of better words, 
all hell broke loose. Foreman's trainer and Daniel's trainer fought each other, and George pushed his own trainer out of the ring. The next two fights were against Charlie Polite and Boone Kirkman, and both went the distance. Foreman's cardio issues were amplified by the fact that he had gained a substantial amount of weight and that each new opponent was entirely fresh. Once again, Ali coached the fighters through their rounds, as much to taunt Foreman as to offer advice. Polite showed George absolutely zero respect, imitating Ali and throwing sloppy punches with no setup. He also obeyed Ali's every instruction as if he were really cornering him. Foreman knocked him down once, but Polite was right back up, and a boxer with a 13-30 record taunted the former heavyweight champion until the end of the match. Frustrated by his inability to knock out Polite, Foreman began to bully his own team member. Always the helpful one, Ali decided to show him how to cover up. For the last fight, Ali changed his tune, cheering Foreman on, which, of course, only served to enrage Foreman even more. Boone Kirkman was the most experienced opponent, and although Foreman got close to a knockout on several occasions, Kirkman was able to weather the storm, and also land a great deal of powerful punches himself. After all the fights were over, Foreman went to once again talk to Ali, only to find that Ali had already left on his way to another fight. The night had been a disaster. Foreman would later explain he was trying to regain his confidence. What he didn't realize was that the world still thought more of him than he thought of himself. He thought he would come off as a brave, resilient underdog, fighting five men in one night. But by choosing men who were far inferior in skill and treating them disrespectfully, he had made his opponents the underdogs and himself the powerful Goliath to be conquered. And the crowd was rooting for them simply to make it through three rounds with George Foreman. The crowd had not come to see George Foreman beat up weaker opponents. They had come to see if the weaker opponents could endure. Foreman never would get another fight with Muhammad Ali, but he would come back a new man with renewed confidence and a vastly different outlook on life and what it meant to be a fighter. Astonishingly, he would retake the heavyweight championship at the age of 45. But that was 10 years later and a video for another time. Stay tuned for breakdowns of the fights between Foreman, Ali, and Frazier. MMA breakdowns will continue with the same frequency as before after a brief hiatus, so please bear with me. The Four Kings saga will continue next with The War. From the Modern Martial Artist, this has been David Christian, wishing you happy training.